while you're finding uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and getting settled, let me just uh, tell you about an amazing ministry that is part of Calvary. It's called Calvary Christian Academy. And it is our private Christian school that uh, provides excellent education in a committed Christian environment uh, for children, uh, three-year-old kindergarten through eighth grade. And, and I mention that because it is a season now of open enrollment. And if you have a child or a grandchild that you think uh, might want to qualify, you can check that out. Uh, they have their own website as well as you can just stop by and, and uh, get that packet from them. But it's a great option for people who uh, want to check it out and consider that. And I also want to say uh, thanks because last week we had uh, the, the parent-teacher fellowship put on a, a gala. It's a dinner, fundraising dinner. And they raised $67,000 for new technology for the school. Isn't that cool? $67,000 to buy computers and uh, computer microscopes. I don't know how all this stuff works, but it's really cool. And so I just want to praise God for the ministry of Calvary Christian Academy and let you know that uh, if you've got a, a child or grandchild that, that you want to send there, that's great. Uh, and if you don't, you can still support CCA through the uh, tax credit. Just mention that to your tax preparer. It's not too late. If you haven't already done your taxes, you can still contribute toward the scholarship fund of Calvary Christian Academy. So it was the biggest day of Jesus' ministry on earth. We call it the triumphal entry. Uh, he entered Jerusalem to the cheers of thousands who were celebrating his arrival as if he were royalty. They, they were shouting Hosanna uh, to the son of David. They were uh, putting their cloaks down for him to uh, travel over on his way into the city. Uh, and, and, and it was just amazing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were shouting. The biggest day of Jesus' public ministry in those three years. And what does he do? After he gets into Jerusalem, he goes up onto the Temple Mount... And then he turns over tables of money changers and drives them out of the temple. That whole area. It's not like we're talking about a building. We're talking about a square that's giant. And he drives them out of there. Turns over all the tables, uh, the people who are selling the, the doves and, and the animals and the money changers, and says, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Why? Why? Why did Jesus make this public statement in such a dramatic way at the height of his influence? I mean, I don't know if you've read that passage and wondered that same thing. I don't know if you've ever considered that. Here it is, people are cheering and shouting, and then Jesus goes in and wrecks the place. Because that's what he did. Jesus wanted the people to know that the priests and the temple practice as they were conducting it did not represent God. He wanted the people to understand that what they were doing was not representative of God. It was a public condemnation of their abusive practices. Uh, the priests, the, the leaders of the temple, were ripping off the people who came to worship. They're doing it in two ways. Uh, if, if you don't understand the ancient temple worship of the, the Jews, here's, here's what it was. People from all over the world had to come to Jerusalem to worship God, to make sacrifices, and they had to do two things. They had to present an animal that was without blemish, okay? And, and so they showed up with this animal that they brought, and, and the priest there said, your animal is not good enough. You have to buy one of our animals at an inflated price because it's good enough. And then they would take the animals that those people bought and they'd sell them to the next person. Yeah, right. They're just ripping them off. And then it, you had to pay a temple tax. And to pay the temple tax, you, you couldn't just bring your money from all over the Roman Empire because a lot more Jews lived all over the Roman Empire than lived in Jerusalem. They had to bring their local money and only their money, their local money was not good enough for the temple. So they had to exchange the money. Have you guys ever exchanged money? You know that they take a cut, right? When you exchange money, you lose some. Well, they exchange money at a very unfair exchange rate, if you know what I'm, I mean. So they were ripping off these people who came to worship God, and, and they were uh, delighting in that. And that's why Jesus turned over the tables of these people who were ripping off worshipers of God. Now, the closest I can think of, uh, of this is this is the religious equivalent of buying a Coke at Disneyland or at the Cardinals football game. 
You guys ever done that? Yeah. Did you feel good about it when you did it? No. I mean, okay, I looked up the prices because it's been a while since I've been at Disneyland, but for, for a bottle of Diet Coke, it, it's bad enough they don't even have Diet Pepsi, but for a bottle of Diet Coke, it's two seventy nine dollars plus tax, $3. If you go to the Cardinals game, it's five stinking dollars. Yeah, that, that's painful. I mean, you know you can get like two six-packs for five bucks, right? And, and I'm cheap to the core, and, and here's the difference, though. When I go to the Cardinals game or when you take your kids to Disneyland, you want to do it. It's a choice for entertainment. You know they're going to rip you off, right? It's part of the deal. But for the Jewish people going to Jerusalem at that time, they had to go there and worship God. It wasn't an option. It was a compulsion. They had to go and make the sacrifices. They had to pay the taxes. Now, you might be sitting there going, what in the world does this have to do with anything that applies to us? I'm glad you asked. Because today we are continuing our Unleashed series, and we're discussing one of those tragic obstacles that enslaves us, that binds us, that prevents us from living as the free children of God that God intends. Today we're talking about greed. Greed. And I want you to know that greed corrupts. Greed corrupts. In fact, greed corrupts everything it touches. It is a constant negative influence in our lives. Whether you're aware of that or not, it's true. Um, for instance, greed corrupts religion. Okay, yeah, I mean, it corrupts religion. We just looked at an example. The temple of Jesus' day was built to be a place of worship, sacrifice, and prayer. That, that's why it was constructed. That's why they put it up. The religious leaders took advantage of their power to make a profit. They took advantage of the people to make a profit. They weren't there to make a profit. God had never said to them, you need to make a profit off of this. They just decided, hey, you know what we could do? We could make a profit. And so, by the way, the, the, some of the richest people in Jerusalem were the priests. They, they were wealthy. They were an elite class because they ripped off devout worshipers simply because they could. Greed corrupted worship. Aren't you glad that never happens today? Yeah, me too. Now, it's still true today. Greed corrupts religion. People put money ahead of the mission of God. Uh, we see it in the televangelist scandals. Uh, you know, there, there's still pastors who are defending the fact that they own private jets. Plural. Yeah, I mean, there, there's pastors who do that. Uh, they live lavish lifestyles uh, and uh, they call themselves servants of God. The Apostle Peter kind of addressed that in 2 Peter chapter 2. He's talking about false teachers and he said, their heart is trained in greed. Isn't, isn't that amazing? Of course, I've seen it up close uh, because about, uh, you know, 19 years ago here at Calvary, we hired a guy who ended up embezzling about $40,000 from our school, and, uh, and he has a felony record to prove it now. But, uh, but the thing is, greed corrupts even religion, and it corrupts religious leaders. And so we put some safeguards in place here at Calvary uh, to try and protect us from that, uh, because we know that greed corrupts. So, uh, for instance, we have multiple layers of accountability with all the finances. I mean, we've got, you know, people inside that are looking after people who are handling the money and people who are handling, all, you know, all kinds of layers inside. And we have outside accountants who are also checking out the, the handling of the money. And for the record, whether you knew this or not, the pastors of Calvary do not handle money and we don't write checks. We do have credit cards, but that has a pretty quick accountability on it, if you know what I mean. So, I mean, so we take those safeguards so that we can protect the integrity because we understand that greed corrupts even religion. And, uh, again, you may or may not know this, but I don't know what individuals give to the ministry of Calvary. I don't have a clue, unless you tell me, and then I, I kind of question your motives. But uh, I'm just being honest, you know, so I don't have access to that information and I don't want access to that information. In 28 years, I haven't looked to see what people give. You know why? Because I don't want to be corrupted by greed. I don't want to show favoritism by treating people differently because they give more than others. So uh, greed corrupts even religion, and, and greed corrupts relationships. 
We know this. We see this. We, we experience this. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, you got to go home and read this. He says this, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not the root. It's a root of all kinds of evil. It, it is through this craving, this love of money, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. They've hurt themselves. They've destroyed themselves. How does that manifest? Usually in relationships. Greed leads to destruction, and the most damage happens in relationships. Uh, you've either heard the stories or you've lived the stories, right? Parents pass away. They leave an estate. It might be a small, insignificant amount of money, or it might be a lot. And the siblings began to fight over it. They, you know, ugliness shows up. Anger shows out. People want, they accuse, they blame. And uh, families are shattered because of greed. Or maybe you've been, uh, you know, in that place where you've heard about business partners who, who've been together a long time. Maybe they're lifelong friends. They said, hey, you know, it'd be great. Let's start a business together. And, and, and they start doing well. And then suddenly uh, one of them cheats the other one out of the business. And friendships are shredded over money. That's greed. Or maybe you've seen that case where uh, children are neglected or even abused because uh, the parents value their things more than they value their kids. And the, and the children grow up knowing and understanding that work and money and possessions take precedence over them. And once again, greed destroys relationships. You see, when you value possessions over people, that's greed. To put it simply, greed is financial selfishness. Greed's financial selfishness. You, you want to define it, you want to understand it. Sin naturally makes us selfish, okay? Understand, that all of us are sinners, so all of us have this selfishness, our, our putting ourselves first inside of us. And, and when we're selfish about money or possessions or things, that's greed. That's how it manifests. That's how it shows up in our lives. And so greed is just financial selfishness. Now, while we're talking about greed, let me clarify a couple of things. Um, first thing is this. You need to understand that no economic system prohibits greed. Okay? Greed is in people. It doesn't matter what system they're, they're operating under. Uh, there's a lot of critics that, that want to criticize capitalism for being kind of a greed-based system because it's a reward-based system. And, and, and that's true. But um, can I just tell you that socialism and communism contain equal amounts of greed? I've been there. I've visited those places in other countries, and I've seen it up close. In fact, greed is present wherever people are present. That, that's just the, the reality. From the wealthiest on Wall Street to the poorest of the poor in Africa, greed is part of our lives because sin is part of our lives. First time I went to, to Mozambique, uh, I, I asked the, the missionary there. I said, okay, hey, we want to do something to bless the pastors that I'm teaching. And I said, so, uh, you know, as a church, we want to invest in them some. So can, you know, can we, you know, would it bless them to give the, their churches some money? And he said, no, that'd be terrible. And I go, what do you mean it'd be terrible? He said, well, if you gave the pastors money, uh, some of the other leaders that are there with them for the first time would think, oh, every time they come here, they get money. And they're not giving it to us because of greed. They would automatically go to that place. And he described how greed in the poorest of the poor economies it is rampant because everybody wants more. But greed is not a product only of those who have a lot. Greed is a product of sin, and sin is present in every single culture and every single system. We need to understand that there isn't a, a system that is immune. And by the way, just for the record, it's honoring to God to work hard. It's honoring to God to work hard. He kind of created this world so that you reap what you sow, and if you work hard, guess what? You get good things. And, and that means that, for the record, success is not a sin. Greed is a sin. 
Let me say that again. Success isn't a sin. Greed is a sin. And God wants to set us free from greed. And so the other thing that I want to clarify is that all of us are tempted by greed. All of us. Every single one. Of us. We're not above it. You might think, oh, well, we're in church and we're good people and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and so we're, we're, we want to see ourselves as good. But the truth is we're all tempted to be greedy. We're all tempted to be enslaved by greed. And it's really easy to see greed in other people. Isn't it? Oh, look at him. Look how greedy they are. Oh, did you see that? He's greedy. That's right. She's really greedy. It's really easy to see sins in other people. It's harder to see them in ourselves. And, and by the way, we're really good at justifying our sin. We're really good at justifying our greed, you know, excusing our, our greedy selves. Well, I'm not greedy. I'm just trying to provide for my family. I'm not greedy. I mean, we're only trying to get ahead. I'm not greedy. We deserve it. Can I just tell you that greed is an excellent liar? That's why we live in the prison of it so comfortably. Because it lies to us and it, and it tells us that it's our friend when, when it really wants to destroy our lives. That's why Jesus challenged us to not judge others, but to examine ourselves first. In fact, if you want to read the passage, Matthew chapter 7, the first five verses, great stuff. You could meditate on those all day long. Because after Jesus said, don't judge others, because if you judge others, you're going to be, that same standard is going to be used on you. He says, and don't try to help your brother by taking the splinter out of his eye. You need to take the log out of your own eye first. <laughs> That's Jesus. And he says, don't you worry about their greed. Deal with your greed. Don't worry about their stuff. Deal with your stuff. Because you got stuff. And I got stuff. And so it's so easy to look at others and go, oh, they're, they're greedy. We need to spend some time in the mirror and say, okay, God, I, I'm going to praise you no matter what the answer is, but can you show me my greed? Can you show me how I'm being greedy? See, because that, that's risky. Because we may not like what God shows us. So greed corrupts. And greed is financial selfishness. And greed holds us in prison. So how do we become unleashed from greed? How do we become unleashed from greed? Answer is really simple. Generosity overcomes greed. Okay, generosity overcomes greed. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I know some of you are kind of going, well, is he ever going to get to the scripture verse? Yeah, I actually am. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. Short passage, you ought to underline these, mark these, uh, highlight these, whatever you do, memorize these, print them out, stick them on your walls all over the place. Uh, by the way, Paul is writing to a church where he's showing up and he's raising money for the church in Jerusalem because the church in Jerusalem is poor and persecuted and they don't have any money and they're starving and he's saying, hey, uh, if, if it weren't for them, you wouldn't be here, so I'm going to come and collect some money from you guys. And, and he's basically teaching them all about giving. And this is what he says, verse 6 and 7 is the heart of this. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, if you want the full picture Go home and read chapters 8 and 9 because they're all about this same offering. But the heart of it is this. Did you get this? The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And yes, I read that twice on purpose. Because we need to hear this. He, he says in another translation, it says, remember this. The point is this. This is significant. We need to get this. We need to understand this. If we want to overcome greed, we need to understand generosity. All right? It's that simple. We, let me ask a question. How many people want to be blessed? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, see me afterwards. We need to talk. 
Because if you got too much right now and you know it, we can take some of it off your hands, okay? I'm just saying. But see, we all want to be blessed. And, and God tells us in his word how to be blessed. I mean, this is so simple. It's so straightforward, but we miss it so much. See, here's the difference between greed and generosity. Greed wants to get blessed, and so it tries to attain the blessings on its own. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go get the blessings. I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to enjoy them. It's about me. Generosity says, you know what? I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to try it his way, and I'm going to allow God to bless me, so I'm going to practice generosity that he's asking me to practice so that he will bless me. Now, understand, when God blesses us, God gets to decide how he's going to bless us. So this is not some kind of whacked-out investment strategy. This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. This is about trusting God and saying, God, I'm going to live life your way, and so I'm going to embrace generosity. I'm going to fight for generosity. I'm going to try to live generosity so that you'll bless me. Okay, that, that, that's the straightforward way of doing it. So greed is trying to bless itself. Generosity says, God, you bless me. And we can trust God because he already told us you're going to reap what you sow. Now, we, we all know that you reap what you sow, or at least if you've lived, you know, any length of time, you should figure that out. Now, we like to use other phrases. What goes around comes around. We mistakenly ascribe that to karma, which is a wrong understanding of karma. Any good Buddhist will tell you that. Uh, karma, only, you know, guys, seriously, karma only applies to the next life when you come back as something else in Buddhism. It does not apply to this life. When people go, oh, it's karma, what they're re referring to is you reap what you sow. They're referencing the Bible and using a Buddhist term to do it. Uh, so let's stop that. Okay? Uh, anyway, so I'm sorry. That's just me ranting. Uh, but uh, we reap what we sow, whether that is a little or a lot. Did you guys get the point? Because the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap yeah, and whoever sows bountifully or generously will also reap. Yeah, it's so simple. There it is. You're going to reap what you sow. And God's the one who's telling you this. And, and so uh, generosity says, look, you know what? I'm going to be generous. I'm going to trust God to bless me. I mean, after all, God's already blessed me because I'm alive. And, and, and he's already given me salvation through Jesus. And he's already taken away my sins. He's already promised me heaven. And, and every good thing in life is from God. So he's already blessed me like crazy. Wow, so I'm going to bless others. Now greed says, I don't have enough. I need more. I need more. So I'm going to keep what I have, and I'm going to try to get more. And when I have enough, then I'll share it. Then I'll bless others. That's one of the lies that greed tells us. When I have more, then I'll share with others. You know what the problem with greed is? You never have enough. You never have enough. You always need a little bit more. And then by the time you have enough and you know it, you've gotten so used to having it, oh, you don't want to give it away. There's a lot of people who say, well, you know, if I, when I get more, I don't have enough money to be generous right now. When I get more money, then I'll be generous. That's a lie of greed. That's a lie of greed. Greed always promises in the future, I'm going to do this. But generosity, just like greed has no, you know, whether you have a lot or a little has no bearing on it, generosity is the same way. If you're generous when you got nothing, if you end up with a lot, you'll be generous. But if you're greedy and stingy when you got nothing, guess what? When you get a lot, you'll be greedy and stingy. That's the way it works. And, and, and so, because you're going to reap what you sow. By the way, generosity results in joy and contentment. It's part of the blessings of God. Greed just feeds dissatisfaction and envy. It's what goes with it. Because there's always people with more than you. And, and, and you feel like you should have more. See, generosity fulfills our purpose and aligns with God's heart. Did you catch that? If, if you want to align with God's heart, then you're going to be generous because God loves a... Yeah. See, we read that stuff, and then we just go out and keep living our life the same way. We, this is where we've got to, you know, repent. We've got to change our mind. We've got to change the way we approach life. We've got to change the way we see things and go, wait, if I want to be like Jesus, then I need to become a cheerful giver. That's hard work. 
Now, some of you have put the work in, and you're there, and you're like, yeah, I love giving. But there's a lot of you that are going, I love Jesus, but I don't love giving. Now, just being honest, you love Jesus, but you're like, I don't, I don't want to give that much. I, I, I like my stuff. I don't, I don't have the money to do it. And, and right now, God is challenging you, saying, hey, you want to hang out with me? You want to share my heart? I love cheerful givers. Now, he loves you. Jesus loves you, okay? There's no question about that. But the people who really walk with the heart of God are the people who understand this whole cheerful giving thing. On the other hand, greed tries to fill this endless hunger for more. And in the end, completely disappoints. Greed never delivers what it promises. You know why? Uh, Jesus said this. What does it profit someone if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? and lose their family, and lose their friends, and still don't have enough. Uh, you see, the God-directed way to overcome the temptation of greed is the practice of generosity, is the discipline of generosity. Let me say that again. The God-given way for you to overcome this, this prison of greed is to practice generosity. Because some of you are sitting here right now going, I know I should do this, but I don't want to. It's really hard. How am I going to do this? Some of you are trying to tune me out right now, but the Holy Spirit's going to annoy you. So it um, doesn't matter if I'm talking or not, because uh, he's inside of you if you're a follower of Jesus, so you can't really shut him out. By the way, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this stuff applies to you, but it's a whole lot better when you actually get heaven along with it. So I'm just uh, saying you ought, to, you ought to go ahead and decide to follow Jesus. So um, here's the thing. If, if we want to overcome the temptation of greed, we practice generosity, which means we give to God and we give to others. And when we are generous on a regular basis, it opens the door to more of God's blessings. Because the one who sows sparingly will also reap. And the one who sows generously will also reap. Yeah, it, so you guys got this. The point is this, and you guys are getting the point. So that's, that's a good thing. See, I want you to actually memorize this before you leave. Uh, you already have, really. So... Uh, it just opens the door. Now, here's what it looks like to me, and I want to show you this uh, with an illustration. So I'm going to move this out of the way so everybody can see this, because sometimes we just need the imagery to go with what we're doing. So uh, I've asked uh, Pastor Robert if he'd help me. He's going to play the part of God. <laughs> okay? That's right. He is not God, and he knows that, but he's going to play the role on uh, TV or on stage. So, well, we are on, we're being recorded. So, um, this is your life, okay? It's your life, and it is already filled with blessings, whether you know Jesus or not, because God has blessed you with life, and he's blessed you with family, and he's blessed you with food, and he's blessed you with all the good things that you have in your life. It's already blessed, but you come to that point in your life where you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to trust him, and now the Holy Spirit of God moves in you, and he begins to bless you in all these kinds of ways with the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That God is filling your life with good things. There are, there are friends, there's fellowship, there's mission, there's purpose, there's joy. And, and God just is pouring these blessings into our lives, and we are loving it. We're like, this is awesome. God is so good. And, and I just want more of him and more of him and more of the blessings. And then there comes a point where they, it seems like it starts to slow down and maybe even stop. And we're kind of like, well, why isn't God blessing me like he used to? Why isn't God pouring more stuff into my life? And, and, and the truth is, what happens is our lives are full. And we weren't meant, we weren't created to keep it all in. That's greed. We were created to give it away. And so when we start giving it away, when we, I, I know it's going to affect some of you poorly. Uh, <laughs> but you can wait. We're almost done here. But when we start giving it away, it allows God to pour more blessings in us. This is the way it's supposed to work. Now, in our life, we, we struggle to learn that, so we stop giving it away, and then, again, God stops blessing us because we're going to reap what we... Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Again, greed is a liar, and, and if you ask people, 99% of them, hey, are you greedy? What are they going to say? No, I'm not greedy. I'm not greedy at all because, you know what? The other day at Starbucks, I paid it forward. Oh, and, and you know what? I sponsored uh, the cancer walk and uh, the domestic violence walk. 
Oh, and I bought Girl Scout cookies. Wait, does that count as generosity? I don't know. Uh, maybe you gave them to the soldiers. Uh, and, uh, oh, and you know what? There was a homeless guy, and I had some leftover change, and I gave it to him. And we go, okay, so, wait, that, that didn't really move anything, did it? See, we convince ourselves that we're generous when we're not by God's standards. So here's how God describes generosity. This is what a lifestyle of generosity looks like. It begins when we say, hey God, I'm going to give to you what you ask because you've given me everything. I'm going to give you 10% of my income. It's called tithing. Yeah, I'm going to give you 10% because you've blessed me with all of it and you've just asked for me to demonstrate my faith back to you. And so I'm going to tithe. And I'm not going to stop there though because you know what? Uh, the church has a building fund because they want to keep meeting the needs of people. I'm going to give a little bit more to the building fund. And, and oh, by the way, there's these children of compassion that are hungry. And I'm going to sponsor a child of compassion because that's generosity. And you know what? Our students are going to camp and some of them can't afford it. I'm going to scholarship a kid to go to camp, see their life change with the gospel. And, uh, oh, and this, you know, friend of mine, they have a, a son or daughter that's going to go on a mission trip, and they need some help getting the money for that. I'm going I'm to support that. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to pay it forward at Starbucks, and I'm going to sponsor the, the domestic violence walk, and I'm going to give some change, and I'll give the change to the homeless. I'm going to buy them sleeping bags and coats. And, uh, and, and not only that, but I'm also going to tip like crazy at the restaurants and smile and treat them kindly in the name of Jesus. See, that's a lifestyle of generosity. And when you have that lifestyle, look what happens. God is always pouring into your life the blessings. Okay, we're going to stop with the illustration because I don't want to make a mess. Thank you, Robert slash God, for doing that. Wow, you just got applause for pouring. So here's the thing. You got a choice. We live in greed without even thinking about it, and God invites us to freedom through generosity. And most of us are not as generous as we think we are. We're not as generous as God calls us to be. So what are you going to do about it? Because the heart of God is always to be generous. So here's the, if you're not sure whether you're really generous or not, if you're not really sure which way your life is leading or not, um, let me ask this question, because this will really help you figure out whether you're generous or whether you're kind of leaning toward greed. Do you want to give more or less? Do you want to give more or less? And see, it's easy. We all know the, the church answer. We all know the right answer. But this is a, a time spent with the Holy Spirit in front of the mirror of your soul and going, hey, what am I really inclined to do? What am I really inclined to give? Do I want to give more away or do I want to keep more for myself? Because the heart of Jesus is always to give more. More love, more grace, more joy, more generosity. So what's your heart's desire? Um, generosity is the path to freedom. And, and my prayer is that, that you'll choose it. Now, here's the, the real practical part, because there's some of you who are sitting here going, yes, God, I want to be more generous. Yes, I want to. What does that mean in my life? Let me challenge you at this point. Wherever you are in your walk with Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, here's some steps to take. Practical steps, okay? Number one, if you've not been giving anything to the ministry of Calvary, just start giving something. Just say, okay, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start giving something. Now, if you've been giving something occasionally, can I challenge you to start giving regularly? Just go, hey, God, you know what? I've I, I, I just been dropping stuff in randomly, uh, but once a month, I'm going to start giving something. Or every, every week, I'm going to start giving something. Whatever works for your schedule, your page, just say, I'm going to start being a regular giver to God. If you're a regular giver and you're like, hey, uh, you know what? I, I give regularly to the church, but it's not a tithe. Can I challenge you? to start tithing? Some of you are like, oh, I don't have that much money. Can I just challenge you? Trust God. Trust God. He, he, look, he's not going to fail you. Give him, give him three months. Just say, okay, God, uh, you've, you've challenged me in Scripture to, to test you with this, so I'm going to test you. Let God show up in your life in, a, in an amazing way. He, he's not going to fail you. So if you've just, you just been given regularly, uh, start tithing. Now, some of you have been tithing, and you're like, yeah, we're the good guys in this story. 
We're already at that point of obedience. Yes, you are. So if you've been tithing, then I challenge you to give sacrificially. Abundantly. Give, give, give more. The tithe is the beginning point of generosity. It's not the end point. And God calls us to, to give ourselves to him and to bless others with that. And it's a both and. It's giving to the kingdom of God and blessing others as you have opportunity. And the point is this. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. And if you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. And each one of you should give what he decides in his or her heart to give. Not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. God, you know our hearts. We cannot hide them from you. And you know, you know the greed that rests down deep in our souls. The ways that it manifests in hurting relationships. You know how it manifests in corrupting the things that we want to be good? And God, we just admit that tonight. We're not who we want to be. So right now, speak to our souls. We listen. We open our, our ears and our hearts to your Holy Spirit, and we're ready to say, yes, I will. So meet us in this place. Meet us in this quiet and whisper into our souls those words of life. And give us the courage to trust you differently than we have. Give us the courage to be faithful more than we've ever been before so that we can experience the generosity of the King of kings and the Lord of lords who loved us and sacrificed his son for us. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.